last Tuesday, I was blessed with the opportunity to offer a teaching at Congregation Emmanuel for their annual interfaith service. I offer deep gratitude to Rabbi Romer for asking me to be part of the service, and it was also beautiful. Our Catskills, UU Catskills, made a fine showing, the choir singing breaths, and three UU youths did a wonderful job reading. It was a beautiful night, um, and I, the theme of the teaching was about truth-telling and its relationship to the time of year for Thanksgiving. I'm not going to deliver that talk, teaching, <laughs> sermon tonight. I will post it on our Facebook page um, today, sorry. Um, but I'm going to take a little portion of it because it leads into where I want us to go. So most of you know I used to be an educator, right? I, well, I still teach, right? But from, that's how I mostly made my living. And a lot of times I would be in classrooms or schools and would watch teachers really just trying to get information into kids' heads, right? There was more time spent on a lesson and less time giving children the opportunity to share their own feelings or perceptions or questions and wonderings. And it uh, always kind of bothered me, right? And I'm sure each of us in this room have one example of a lesson that we were taught that made us go, huh, I wonder if that's true. Or, I wonder if that's the whole story, but the rest of the story. I'm Paul Hardy, and this is the rest of the story. Right? In school and elsewhere, we learn a lot of stories, tales of historical events and figures, things that we're supposed to commit to memory because they are important. But we never seem to discuss whose version of the story we are learning. And as we get older, we hopefully engage more critically with these stories and other big ideas or truths with a capital T. And we might get a chance to ask some good questions like, who decided that this was the way we should think about this? Or whose voices are we not listening to? When we ask these kinds of questions, even of something that we've long thought to be true and absolute and accepted as is, we begin to see and hear multiple perspectives and our world gets changed. I'm especially reminded this of certain times of the year and November and the coming of Thanksgiving sends off all kinds of alarm bells for me. As a country, we are preparing to celebrate a holiday that perpetuates one version of a story that at best is a mishmash of half-truths and at worst, pure mythology. A mythology that has inaccurately passed on facts and feelings, a mythology that tries to paint a pretty picture, a mythology the historically silenced voices have repeatedly told us is inaccurate, harmful, and an unfair portrayal that erases more valuable truths. The images that surround Thanksgiving and the practices we've made tradition, including costume-laden reenactments and inaccurate supper menus <laughs> perpetuate the mythology, making it really hard for other voices, voices carrying different truths, to break through. Now I know I sound like a total downer, because <laughs> we all like the idea of taking time off from work to gather together with family and eat too much and maybe watch football or the Macy's Parade, right? And maybe that's the good part for some people, the together part, the offering gratitude part, the getting a bit of rest part. But just because there may be a good part doesn't mean we can ignore the rest of the story. Here's something I learned 25 years ago when I was teaching at the American Indian Heritage School in Seattle, Washington. One of my dear friends, colleagues, the principal of the school, and thus my mentor, the late Robert Eaglestaff of the Lakota Sioux Tribe introduced me to a powerful teaching. The hurt of one is the hurt of all. The hurt of one is the hurt of all. Mm -hmm. So if someone, anyone, tells us that our words or actions or holidays or reenactments or celebrations or stock stories or teachings, or policies hurt them, erase them, damage their spirits, their people, their stories, then we must reconsider them. 
For many Native people, Thanksgiving is a ritual of mourning. But lots of us can't understand this because we never learned the rest of the story. A story that includes massacre, denigrating language, a presidential attempt to unite the nation, and ultimately a decision to find a way to Americanize and control new immigrants, which gave rise to the sanitized, peaceful faux history of the meal that inspired Thanksgiving the holiday. Sean Sherman, an Ogallala Sioux tribal member, professional chef and author, wrote this about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving really has nothing to do with Native Americans and everything to do with an old guard conjuring a lie of the first peoples welcoming the settlers to bolster their false authority over what makes a real American. Mm -hmm. So when we do a little digging, we find deeper truths that call us to listen. And these deeper truths are part of the reason why I lost interest in celebrating Thanksgiving many years ago. This lack of interest was compounded by the prospect of spending time with my extended family, <laughs> who had, for many years, made me feel icky. <laughs> I couldn't find a better word. So to say that I'm not a fan of Thanksgiving in the traditional sense would be an understatement. That is not to say, however, that I am not a fan of the concept of thanksgiving or the practice of being grateful, of giving thanks, and of remembering my blessings. I have had periods in my life when I suffered from depression and felt lost and at sea, and as a result, could not see my blessings, could not conjure up a word of thanks I received treatment in the traditional pharmacological way, and I am grateful for that. But I also know that I would get in my head and say, there's an Italian phrase I would say all the time, la mia vida è un casino, <laughs> which means my life is a mess. <laughs> and I'd say that over and over, and guess what? My life was a mess, because I kept saying it over and over. So um, my work, in mindfulness and big changes I made, one of which stopped saying, la mia vida en casino. <laughs> and when I would listen to my own stories and my truths and listen to those of others and started to make changes both up here and in how I lived, I have come to believe what that article says, that living with gratitude is good for me and it's good for all of us. Research now shows that having an attitude of gratitude changes the molecular structure of the brain, keeps gray matter functioning, and makes us healthier and happier. When you feel happiness, the central nervous system is affected. You are more peaceful, less reactive, less resistant. Gratitude can show up in many forms. Numerous religious traditions include explicit gratitude practices. I am reminded that for my Jewish friends, while still in bed, they are to say, Mode Ani, I offer thanks to you, right? Thanking God for another day of, of life. And what about giving thanks before we eat? Buddhists do that. And many years ago, I was a classroom helper in a Lutheran preschool and marveled at the variety of ways kids could sing or say grace before lunch and snack time. I know that feeling grateful on a daily basis can sometimes be challenging. When things are just not going our way, we can't catch a break. It is hard to count blessings. It is far easier to live in the wreckage of the future and worry and brood. But again, research shows that if we switch our thinking from the bummer time thoughts and the negative stories, we can change our brain chemistry and thus our ongoing thoughts and actions and ultimately our energy and how we interact in the world. I am inviting all of us to enter into an attitude of gratitude, to find ways to count our blessings, to offer thanks to one another, to ourselves, 
to the universe, to whatever god or goddess you choose. I wonder how you all do this. Maybe over lunch, I can hear. Do you keep a gratitude journal? Maybe you meditate in the morning, at the end of your sit, you give thanks for that opportunity. Maybe you do say thanks before each meal. Or maybe, sometimes, just like me, you find yourself overwhelmed at some point in the day by the beauty or the joy or the blessings that surround you. Whatever it is, let's do more of it. <laughs> if we practice, practice mindful gratitude, it's contagious. We will be kinder to one another. We will be more inclined to offer thanks and appreciate, to provide help to those in need without any expectations of reciprocity. And we will probably be able to listen more attentively. In doing so, we can heal ourselves and each other and maybe make strides toward healing the world and making it a more just and loving place. So maybe, may we be reminded each day of the blessing of life. May we offer thanks and praise whenever the Spirit moves us. May we work to heal ourselves and one another by living mindfully and gratefully. May it be so. <laughs>